Teslas are known for lasting a good long time. Sometimes you got to swap out the battery. Sometimes you got to swap it out a bunch of times. Well, what if I told you there was a Tesla that had 475,000 miles on it with just one battery swap up until now? Uh, maybe that would be great. Maybe it'd be disappointing. We'll find out. I'm Brian. Welcome to Future Aza. Oh, 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 oh. Check it out. It's Alex from What Works and also from your channel on YouTube where you've got some pretty exciting stuff. Give us a quick pitch on your channel. Yeah, so I do a lot of videos for Auto Spec Renew. Uh, so I do a lot of repairs on uh, all sorts of electric vehicles and I kind of document that stuff on the, on the Auto Spec Renew channel. Including Guy Kyle's goofy cars? Yep, including a lot of Kyle's goofy cars for sure, <laughs> yeah. Kyle from Auto Spec has some very unusual vehicles from time to time. And sometimes he has vehicles that just have weird problems I've seen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like that leaf in California. Yep, yeah. The weird charging port issue. Anyway, what uh, your car had 470, what was it at? Uh, it's almost at 472,000 miles now. And you swapped out your battery. Was it dead? Um, so no, the, the battery that I pulled out was actually still in pretty good condition. Um, at least as, as well as you can expect for a, a battery that's got well over 200,000 miles on it. About 15% degradation and, and whatnot, but otherwise fully functional. Uh, but yeah, I went ahead and pulled it out in order to upgrade it to a larger battery. Yeah. So uh, what did you have? What was it before? So the car's a 70D, so it had the 70 kilowatt hour uh, 84S pack. Yeah, 350 volt. So you increased your capacity by a third, by half. Really? It's about 50% bigger? Yeah, nearly a 50% increase in capacity. So yeah, it went from the 70 kilowatt hour to a 100 kilowatt hour. Now on those 85s, could you charge them to 100 safely since they were, since it was a 70, an 85 locked at 70? Well, no, so it's a factory 70, 70 kilowatt hour pack. Oh, real so it's 70. A, yeah, so it's a 14 module pack, only 350 volts, yeah. <laughs> so he knows because this is what he does. Now when people, uh, People are still always worried, a battery's gonna die, battery, what's it gonna cost? What's it gonna cost? And the answer is it varies, right? Yeah, I mean, it definitely varies. And a lot of issues with the battery packs can be repaired. It really just depends on what the failure mode is. So, I mean, in cases of like uh, battery management system related issues or moisture intrusion causing problems, a lot of those issues can be fixed. If it's something where it's a, a cell that's become parasitic, that's a little bit more tricky. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, of course, uh, in some cases you end up needing to do a full battery replacement. Now the warranties are very long. So repairs on threes and Ys didn't kick off right away uh, for yeah. third party, but they've been around long enough. A lot of them are out of warranty. Yep. Are you seeing high rates of failure? Um, I mean, there certainly is a failure rate there. Um, I haven't personally dealt with a lot of model three and Y stuff. Uh, I do have a couple of Model 3s at my shop right now, though, that um, one of them wasn't actually a battery-related issue, but it was more of kind of a collision damage issue where somebody ran over something and it broke one of the plastic uh, oh. coolant hose connections off the battery. But yeah, I have another one at my shop that does actually have uh, a bad pack. Uh, had a, a basically a cell that developed a week short, and it basically caused a parasitic drain on the rest of the cells around it within the brick. and you know, basically drains it down to almost nothing. So that one's actually getting a replacement pack, yeah. So because the threes and Ys are so much more common, are they, uh, are the packs cheaper than the S and X? I mean, they're smaller. Yeah, absolutely. They are quite a bit cheaper just because there's so many of them out there. Um, I mean, cars get wrecked every day and there's a huge uh, supply of used good condition packs that can be used to swap into cars. So how much is a used or reconditioned pack before labor? So for a Model 3 pack for, say, like a long range, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about six to 7,000 for a good condition used pack. And uh, yeah, so the idea is, while pack failures are not super common, um, if <laughs> your V8 goes out, you've got a problem that, usually when something like that happens on a vehicle of higher mileage, you chuck it. Because if, you're, if you blow your motor, if you blow your transmission, Believe me, I have replaced items like that on high mileage cars and it was not worth it. Yeah, it can get expensive. Well, in my case, it was only uh, maybe three, 4,000. 
Yeah. Uh, but I did not get another three, four thousand of life out of it. It right. was a used. Yeah. The car wasn't. It was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Uh, anything. Uh, so let's talk about some goofy stuff that you get to deal with through your channel, through Kyle's weird little stuff. Yeah. What are some crazy things that you've worked on? Uh, well, so just recently I did some modifications to a Nissan Leaf limo for a cheap car challenge. <laughs> uh, so it got kind of some sketchy modifications, not normal stuff that I would do on, on a customer's thing, but this is a kind of a special use case. It actually got a second battery pack put in the, in the middle limo section of the Leaf. Uh, so now it's a, it's a double pack Leaf. So what did that put it up to? What was it? Uh, so the original pack was pretty highly degraded, and that was actually the one that got repackaged and put in the middle. It was about 40% degradation. Oh, wow. So it's only got like 60% of its original capacity. And then underneath the car where the battery pack normally lives, I swapped in just a newer, better condition pack that had, I think, about 83% state of health. So if you combine the two of them together, you get maybe close to 30 kilowatt hours usable. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Any other fun ones from uh, from recent times? Um, I mean... Well, before we say that, we, we should mention that in the shop, you've worked on Fiat's, you've worked on the Mercedes. Uh, uh, lots of Mercedes B250E, Toyota RAV4 EV, which are both uh, Tesla-powered cars. Um, of course, I deal with, yeah, lots of Nissan Leaf, older Model S, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I definitely have had some oddballs in the shop, too, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of Kyle stuff, anything else fun that you can... can uh... um, I've had a couple of IMEVs in that I worked oh, wow. on. Um, and then, um, just this last week, I was actually in North Carolina. And we were looking at some stuff from the collection of Carbera EVs from Tennessee. So, made a little bit of progress in terms of trying to figure out what's wrong with some of the stuff there. Uh, to hopefully try and get it running. And then some of the other ones are going to be kind of long-term projects to mm. attempt to get running. Uh, are they at least fun cars to be to be bringing back to life? Um, they're certainly rare and interesting. Okay. Um, so some of them are extremely rare. Some of them, I mean, all per, all of them are pretty rare. They're all from late 90s, early 2000s. So um, very low production volumes. But one of them in particular is a Dodge Epic minivan, which is basically an electric Dodge caravan. Uh, it's one of three left known to exist. Wow. So, very rare car. Um, and then we've got a Ford Ranger EV, two Chevrolet S10 EVs, which are also super rare, probably maybe a couple dozen at most left wow. in existence. Um, but those actually use the same powertrain as the GM EV1, which is oh. kind of the most famous of all the car era EVs. Sure. And, and I'll say, I've, while I've heard of the S10, I don't think I've ever seen one in real life. Yeah, they're certainly not very common, but um, they kind of blend in. So if you ever did see one, you probably wouldn't even notice it. Well, I, I would I would see it at a show. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only place. On the road, you definitely wouldn't know. But I don't know how many people are actually <laughs> using it. Yeah, using for sure. Using those as their daily drivers. Yeah, the, the number of them that are out there is really low, and the number of them that actually run is even lower. Lower still. I'd, I'd be yeah. surprised if there's more than a single digit number of running examples. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, is there anything else? Uh, oh. So a question I would have is, if someone's got an older S, they love it, they don't want to get rid of it, uh, how low would their battery need to get before they should start thinking, maybe I should upgrade to a 100 uh, kilowatt pack? I mean, it really just depends on kind of what your use case is and whether or not the car works for what you do. I mean, if the car does everything you need it to do, there's not really a reason to upgrade. Most of the time, if anybody were to approach me for an upgrade, it would be because they have an existing issue with the pack and, you know, they have the option of either trying to repair it, replace it with another like-for-like -like pack, or upgrade it to a bigger pack. So that's kind of one of the likely scenarios where that would happen. But I've, I've had a number of people inquire about just upgrading the pack preemptively because they want to have faster charging, more range, sure. and, and everything else when comes you, along when you, when you put in a new pack, do you get faster charging? Absolutely, yeah. So the 100 kilowatt hour pack compared to, I mean, particularly compared to my old pack, which is just the smaller 70 kilowatt hour, when you talk about like charging speeds as far as like road tripability, so say plugging in at around 10%, charging for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, uh, it adds about double the amount of energy in the okay. same amount of time. So it basically cuts your charging time in half on a road trip situation. Wow. And then, uh, and then you go into the, 
you go into the software and tell the car it's no longer a 60, 75, 80 kilo, whatever? Yeah, so uh, in Tesla Toolbox, which is the diagnostic software that is used for the Tesla vehicles, uh, there are procedures in there in order to pair a new pack with the car and it updates the configuration and, and all that stuff. There's a few things that sometimes have to be manually tweaked, like setting you know, performance configuration and stuff, but it's, uh, it's, it's a relatively straightforward process. And if someone has a, a, a software lock pack, you can't fix that. Yeah, so <laughs> the, the big thing on the software locked packs is that it's almost always on 350 volt packs. Mm. And Tesla does a pretty weird thing where they kind of enforce um, the, the software limit on any pack that's a 350 volt which kind of is a problem on a lot of uh, on a lot of cars that people are swapping 350 volt 90 kilowatt hour batteries into which that's essentially a 100 kilowatt hour pack minus two modules wow and that's used as that's a pretty common replacement configuration that pack was actually never equipped from the factory in any car mm. so it's solely just a replacement pack um, and if you swap it into a car it's going to revert back to the car's original configuration uh, but if you do a 400 volt pack it's not really a problem. So a 400 volt 90, 100 kilowatt hour, or a 400 volt 85 pack. Mm -hmm. And then of course, lastly is, I know you haven't torn apart a Cybertruck yet. Do you foresee there being any uh, problems getting your job done as the guy who keeps them fixed and running five, 10 years from now? Yeah, so I mean, it's, there's kind of limited info out there on what's, uh, you know, kind of what potentially potential problems could be in the future. But just based on kind of some information from teardowns and stuff that people have done, it looks like the serviceability of the pack probably isn't that great. Um, so we'll just have to see how well the packs hold up over time and what kind of issues they may or may not end up having. And the last thing is, gentleman in Michigan who had a, who has a model uh, S, mm -hmm. 377,000 miles, first pack. Yeah. Still on the first pack. How much has he spent keeping it running this whole time with repairs and maintenance, would you guess? Probably pretty low. Well, what's your guess? Um, I mean, I imagine it's probably had some small stuff like door handles and stuff, but the powertrain obviously would have been under warranty for, you know, eight years unlimited mileage. Right. Don't know what, what, what year is the car? I don't recall. It okay. might be a 12. So. Oh, if it's a 12, that's a really early car. But um, it's, it's, I don't remember if you guys are yeah. watching, but uh, what's your guess? I would guess maybe a couple thousand bucks total. No, 19. 19. He, he had an expensive something, uh, might have been the BMS or something, but okay. there was something uh, that was a big expense. Yeah. And then of course, you know, little things, the, the handles and yeah. the, might have re had to replace the air on it. I'm not, I'm okay. not sure what all. And I asked him why and he said, because I love my car and it's still cheaper than buying two more cars. Yeah. Which, let's face it, uh, that kind of mileage. Yep. I've seen very, well, my uncle's gas car got 500,000 miles, great. But he also put a lot into it. Yeah. And those are very rare. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, link in the description, head over to Alex's channel, find out what it's all about. If you're in the greater Portland area and you need help, what works? is the place what like you know electricity works as in uh what he does all day uh what did i miss what did i misunderstand what questions would you have for alex just go to his channel and ask him yourself i mean you could do both everybody else like subscribe do what you do stay tuned stay juicy and i cannot wait to hear from you clever robots on the next one